Hello everyone, Ethis here. I have some exciting news. I'm sure some of you have already guessed what it is, but we will get to that very soon. So the night before last was a letter from the producer Live Part 27, aka the 3.2 Preview Part 2, and it featured a discussion with localization team lead and lorecrafter Koji Fox. So I thought that as last time when we had our lore low down with the Fox to Koji, I'd give you guys a summary for anyone that missed it and elaborate on the more interesting parts where we can do so. I was hoping that Koji Fox would make a post elaborating on the discussion, so I held off on recording this for a few days, but it doesn't seem likely at this point. Before we get into that, however, I will give a very brief recap of some of the 3.2 preview highlights. Once again, for anyone that may have missed it, given that it was probably around 3am for a lot of you, I should mention that the live letter was once again presented in Japanese, and most of my notes come from the live translation generously and skillfully offered to us by Marco at Marco Turn, and the official translation done by Matt Hilton, Devin Cassie, and Reinhardt of the community team. So just be conscious that this information is coming through those filters. Now the big answer for the big question, 3.2 will be released on February 23, so exactly one week later than I was anticipating, but honestly I'm kind of glad that I have a bit more time to grind out my anima. <laughs> I know I'm slow, I'm lazy, I'm sort of kind of cancerous d-bag. Our Ron Gomiant episode will come when it comes. So we have our training hall equivalent set in the hinterlands named Stone Sky C, which is essentially a three minute dummy pass where you indicate which fight you're training for, such as A4S, and whether you pass or fail will indicate whether you were reaching a sufficient DPS threshold to tackle the fight. It's a solo content with no rewards, and it doesn't seem like there are any actual mechanics to deal with, so I honestly doubt how valuable it will be. I imagine some people use it to learn their rotations rather than just using a training dummy in their yard though, so it is what it is. We have some long overdue tank DPS adjustments, so for tanks in 3.2, Vitality will directly affect attack potency, and I presume this is only for tanks. Vitality is going to be worth more than strength for tanks, so no more melee accessories or pantomelded crafting gear required, hooray. Paladin will be getting some significant adjustments, as will Astrologian, particularly to Shuffle, which will no longer be able to draw the same card twice in a row. Machinists will receive a buff for their sustained damage. Some adjustments will be made to the Warden's Peon for the Bard, hopefully to make it an off-global cooldown skill, and Black Mage seems to be getting a 12-second Astral Fire, which should help a bit. Nath Beast Tribes are coming, will operate in the same way as the Vanu Vanu with the level sink and such, but they will be rewarding more experience, and there, as you can hopefully see in the potato screenshot, a sexy new Dragonfly thing mount. And uh, while I'm thinking of it, the Adamantoy spins. It's straight up Gamera of which I have mixed feelings. It looks super buffy. New PvP, the Feast, level 60 with eye level sync to 150. There's 4v4 and 8v8, solo and party queues, a bunch of new mechanics from supply kits and medals, six tiers of ranks from bronze to diamonds with unique diamond gear rewards as you can see here. The Feast will be accessible in 3.2, but season one will not start until 3.25, so we have five or six weeks to train. New dungeons we'll talk about when we get to what Koji has to say about them. We've got a jukebox furnishing, uh, the new mentor system which will unlock a new roulette with unique rewards and achievements once you have one job from each roll at 60, so that's one tank, one DPS, one healer, have completed at least a thousand instances and earned over 300 commendations. Diadem is going to be shorter, require less ether currents and be worth more tombstones. Uh, material will cost less spoils, so hold on to your spoils for now. Discipline of hand and land adjustments, well apparently there will be some very useful gear recipes for hardcore raid progression this time around and it will take the appearance of Diable High Allegan gear. For other Discipline of Hand and Land stuff, go and nag Mithri or someone because I honestly have no idea. New tombstones will be called Allegan Tombstones of Lore, L-O-R-E, which people in the chat immediately started calling Allegan Tombstones of Ethos, which would irritate me, but Pukajutsu quickly patented the phrase grinding my Ethos, which does have a certain ring to it, so uh, do with that what you will. All roulettes except Mentor will apparently be queuable as a party from now, and there's a few other nice quality of life things, most notably some recast animation display options, including the option to display recast time in numbers on your hotbars. Okay, now onto the interesting segment, at which point our dear friend Mr. Happy and just about everyone else gave up and fell asleep. Koji Fox, uh, he took us down to Bantanamo Bay to give us a lesson in Bantanese as he so often does with these things. So the Q&A was fairly limited. There was a tentative promise made in there somewhere for a part two, but what we did get involved some pretty awesome stuff. So firstly, we have a patch title, The Gears of Change. 
So we can see here some cover art with whom was confirmed to be Minfilia and what appears to be the Mother Crystal in a pretty ragged state. Whilst they were discussing this title, by the way, Koji Fox must have used the word change in English at least a hundred times. Now it's not particularly clear in this screenshot, but you might notice that Minfilia is actually bound to the crystal. It's coiled around her arms and legs like some kind of chain. It's pretty reminiscent of this scene from before the fall part one, but I'm not sure there's any logical connection. Some people have been wondering if there might be some kind of Lissi nonsense going on here, and honestly, once again, I'm not really sure. Essentially, Minfilia is getting back into the picture, and I think, and I hope, that this is going to be the point at which everyone starts appreciating her as Professor Charles Xavier, as I've always been saying. Koji specifically mentioned that we may learn what happened to her, where she came from, what exactly her relationship with the Mother Crystal is, and how the path of the silence might, you guessed it, begin to change. Change also refers to coming change to the Dragon Song War, perhaps some undermining of our expectations. We're going to see more ideological conflict in Ishgard between those who want change and those who don't want change. Koji talked about the gears motif as how one change acts as a catalyst for another change and another change and begins a cascade of changes and of course it also represents Alexander who will change about as much as pulling his other arm out of the water change. Changing change changes change. Changes. Dungeons. The anti-tower we could tell from the screenshots was very clearly Charlene with the same logarithmic spiral motifs we see throughout their architecture in the library, the Arboretum, and throughout the hinterlands of which I am so fond. It's called the reversed tower in Japanese because evidently the Japanese term for the prefix anti can have some negative connotations. People in the chat immediately started making comparisons to Memoria and Ibsen's castle from Final Fantasy IX, and as we look at the screenshots, the homage is pretty obvious with inverted rooms and such. Ibsen's castle appears to have been largely inspired by the work of MC Escher, and I'm sure we'll see something similar here. Lore-wise, Koji Fox tells us that this facility was the place where Charleans researched the Mother Crystal. It could be that they meant to build this anti-tower into the center of the star to try and reach the literal Mother Crystal. It could have been that they built downwards to intersect a major ethereal current. Or it could have been simply that they wanted the project to draw as little attention as possible from parties like the Asians and so kept it underground. Ibsen's castle in Final Fantasy IX was built in an attempt to create a link and merger between two different worlds. So it's not unlikely that the Charlanes were trying to create a place where the physical and ethereal realm could coincide. And it seems to me from this screenshot in particular that they may have actually or very nearly succeeded. Now we've been told that there will be a boss from a previous Final Fantasy title inside the tower, but that there were some difficulties in giving it a uniform name since its original appearance was sometime before the localization team was formed 15 years ago. Final Fantasy IX was originally released in 2000, so I'm guessing the boss will be something from Ibsen's castle, either Tahaka or Agares. Koji Fox didn't have very much to say about the Lost City of Amdapur hard mode, but we do have some screenshots and you guys probably know that I'm hoping to find a certain someone lurking around there. The training feature is named Stone Sky Sea as I mentioned because Koji Fox was imagining us training somewhere high up in the mountains and it does seem to be in fact in the hinterlands and we are told that there will actually be an interesting cutscene at the beginning of the dummy appearing uh, from out of the sky so look out for that. Now we come to the Q&A, the first few questions were the same ones we had during the anniversary broadcast and pretty much every time Koji Fox features in a live letter, so we'll skim over them. What kind of work does the localization team do? How long did it take to localize patches 3.1 and 3.2? Well, the second question is the more interesting one, but we didn't get a direct answer. Instead, Koji Fox told us that the Heaven's Ward expansion took eight people, two and a half months to translate 15 million words. The second question was about names and flavor text of achievements and fates and such, and the reply was basically that the rule of thumb is that things characters can see in Eorzea must be lore adherent, but for things that only the players can see and aren't actually grounded in the world, pretty much anything goes. And that's why we get a whole bunch of bad puns and pop culture references. Ask Denmo for Koji puns, you won't be disappointed. Next question was about the purpose of the Garlane's third eye, and it turns out that it gives them some kind of advanced spatial reasoning that helps with their specialization in handling airships and advanced weaponry. 
that was the answer that Koji Fox gave us, but we know from in-game implications that it seems it also allows them to see something like the ethereal equivalent of the infrared spectrum. The next interesting question was about the various primal specific terms for tempering. And apparently tempered is a, a blanket term for all the primals in the Japanese, but given that it has elemental connotations in the English, we have tempered for Ifrit, drowned for Leviathan, We've seen both Tempered and Touch for Ramu, and we haven't had a direct answer for the others, but I know Animal Anonymous is fond of talking about getting stoned with Titan and uh, getting blown by Garuda. Next question, isn't it about time for more Hildebrand? And Hildebrand will in fact be returning with patch 3.2, so get hyped. An interesting one here about the Aura, specifically whether they are born with their horns and what the other races think of them, but Koji Fox decided to take this in a different direction and actually answer a question I received in Mog Talk last week. So the Zela tribes wander around the north of Doma in the steppes that they refer to as the plains of Azim. Azim being their goddess of the sun, and although we know that worship of the Twelve is a strictly Eorzean phenomena, it can't be a coincidence that Azim and Azima are both sun deities. And Koji tells us the worship of the Twelve and of these other tribes' gods may well have been related a long time ago. The Rayan, we know, tend to settle and stay in one area, and they make up the majority of the Aurar refugees in Eorzea that were displaced by Garlemald. Finally, Koji Fox hinted that there may be other clans besides the Zela and the Rayan, which of course means that there definitely are. And that was it for the Q&A, unfortunately. We've got a couple of main scenario quest teasers, including this one of Thancred having a biff with Orchefont's stepbrother Artoirel for Tom, and this of Alphano, whom I suspect is about to sit down for a cuppa and an overdue reunion with Alizé to discuss what she recently saw in the Google library. The rest of the live letter comprised of announcements such as a new Japanese Heavensward guidebook, a gathering, crafting, and gold saucer guidebook, Heavensward OST release with a spoony bard minion, an upcoming Square Enix title, Dragon Quest Builders, which is straight up DQ Minecraft, and finally the news you've been waiting for. I'm not going to hold my breath just yet because I don't know exactly how much it will tell us that we don't already know, but it will be at the very least an extremely valuable reference and an awesome collector item. Koji Fox has promised that we will have, by the October Fan Festival at the latest, in English, a physical Final Fantasy XIV lore compendium. Holy shit, you guys. This announcement makes up for the disappointment I felt in the Google library a thousand times over. So. Assuming we can buy these at FanFest and get them signed, if you weren't sure if you'd see me in Vegas this October, you can be sure I'll be doing my damn best to get over there now. So there's Live Letter 27, and it, uh, it turned out I had more to talk about on it than I realized, but there you go. Highlight the 23rd on your calendar for more Alex, more story, more Hildebrand. I'm so excited, guys. It's going to be great, and I will see you all there.